Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the very first virtual retirement seminar of 2023. Thank you for joining us today. We have a lot of really great information uh, to share with you in regards to retirement. I'm Josh Black. I'm your APFA National Secretary. And with me today are Kim Tuck and Patrick Hancock. They'll be going through a um, presentation with you today to talk about everything having to do with retirement. And we encourage you to submit your questions during today's session. When you submit a question, please provide your name, your base, and a good phone number or email to be in contact with you in the event we're unable to reach your question today. So without further ado, I will send, hand it over to you. Wonderful, thank you, Josh. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> All right, you're good. All right, and are we gonna get the PowerPoint up on the screen here? Yeah, we're good. Oh, you guys can That's go ahead and click through. All right. It is February 24th, 2023, and this is the APFA Virtual Retirement Briefing. Who are we? Hey, this is Kim Coates Stuck, the APFA National Retirement Specialist, and I'm Patrick Hancock, the APFA Retirement Specialist Emeritus, whatever that means. And I have no idea where these pictures came from. Obviously, somebody photoshopped that. Other than that I never cleared it, but hey, also a shout out to Ron Harris. Ron Harris did a lot of the late work and uh, grunt work to make the slides you're going to see today and uh, gather a lot of this information. And uh, we always do a shout out to Ron because he is always helping people with their retirement questions. Uh, that's him and I on a layover in London. Uh, you can see the red cup in his hand. He may have been overserved. I'm not sure about all that. But anyway, so yeah, so that's who we are. Who we are not is we are not the company. This is a union meeting, and I have been a union rep long enough that I have developed a healthy cynicism about the management of my employer. So if I say something that uh, you know you feel is disrespectful of our employer, yeah, okay. Uh, but we're also not your financial advisors, and you may very well need a financial advisor. We, we can't recommend that strongly enough because even when you're really, really good at getting all the numbers stuff together, a second set of trained eyes is always an excellent idea. And also financial advisors are trained to help you figure out when is the right time to go and uh, when is the right time to continue working. So we, you will, we would strongly recommend that you get financial advisors. That's not us. We're also not your attorneys. We're not your Medicare advisors, your Social Security advisors, and you may need all of these. As of uh, October 2022, we're waiting on the update. Uh, we have 24,652 members. How many of those do you think are over the age of 80? 80. You're wrong. <laughs> it is 20. We have 20 flight attendants over the age of 80. We actually have one over the age of 85, but I can't add that extra bucket because then the whole slide doesn't work. Uh, no, we're not naming any. We're not naming any names, but uh, the flight attendant is over the age of 80, but is 85 or older and has 65 years of seniority. And doing a fabulous job. Fabulous job. So, yeah. So, uh, we've got seven, the 75 to 79 bucket, we've got 134. The 70 next is 519. The 65 to 69, 1656. All of those people are eligible for Medicare as of today if they stopped working. Uh, we've got uh, 3,924 in the 60 to 64 bucket. And in the 55 to 59, we have 5,178, the largest age group bucket in the entire core. Uh, and that means we have 11,431 people that are eligible for retirement today. And if it seems like APFA is spending an awful lot of time and resources to get information on retirement out to people, that's why. I mean, that's what, 30, 40% of our core is eligible to retire today. And uh, not too uh, far on the heels coming up, we've got uh, 2,400, 1,400, uh, 973, 1,700 back there. 30, 30, going up again. Going back up. We've got another bulge coming through. Um, 2,600, and then and then the little junior people you've seen out there, 600 of them, 20 to 24. I have shoes older than that. But anyway. So yeah, that's and that, by the way, is our favorite slide in the whole system. Uh, the whole deck is, uh, and you can go back online and uh, do a screenshot of that when you go watch it, rewatch it on, on our YouTube channel. Housekeeping. Kim, what can you tell us about housekeeping? 
Okay, housekeeping. Uh, well, we wanted to let you know that the good slide handout, our uh, retirement packet from APFA, follows this presentation. So if you have a copy of it, great. If you don't have a copy of it, you can request it by emailing me at retirement at APFA.org, or you can call and uh, request it. And one of our staff members here will have it mailed out to you. And then we also have all the information located on the right. Website. Our retirement page of the APFA website is basically the retirement packet. So you can scroll through that information and click on the things you need to know and not look at the things you need not to know. But a lot of people like to have a paper copy of the packet to take on their trips and study when they when they start thinking about retirement. So we do have that option available as well. OK, so if you have questions, we can. Um, address your questions at certain points throughout this presentation or at the end of the presentation. So go ahead and submit your questions via chat. Um, in the retirement packet, good slide, there are some very helpful checklists if you're considering retirement. So they're located at the end of the retirement packet and they'll help you figure out what you need to do 90 days out, 60 days out, 30 days out immediately after retirement. So those are very useful to have if you're considering retirement and trying to figure out uh, what your date's going to be. Also, there's a contact list, which includes the most important contact of all, www or retirement at apfa.org, because you can always call me and ask me questions if you have questions. The contact list also includes the company benefits lines and you know numbers for all the different vendors like uh, Hyatt Legal, long-term disability, all that good stuff. So very useful information and lots of people like to hang on to it for after they retire. All right, so what does retirement really mean? That's what we're going to discuss in our presentation today. And you know traditionally it's broken down into three components. First of those being medical benefits. The second is retirement benefits, such as your retiree pass privileges. And the third, which is your pension and 401k, although we've had to re revise that because it's 401k for everybody who was hired after 2012 and nobody else is going to have a pension going forward. So that 401k is more and more important as we move along because that's going to be people's primary source of retirement income other than Social Security. So for medical benefits, we like to refer to that. Well, we don't like to, but we do refer to it as the incredibly shrinking, incredible shrinking basket. It was uh, impacted by bankruptcy and our medical benefits once we retire are pretty much nil. So um, there is a retiree medical plan, but it's super expensive and not a whole lot of people opt for that. So we're going to discuss some other options. So important questions you have to ask yourself. First of all, what do I need to retire? What do you get in retirement? Uh, what about income? That's huge. And what else do I need to research? All those annoying little details that you didn't think of before. So what do I need to retire? First of all, you need to be eligible. And you need money. And you need to be ready. That's probably the most important. I talk to people every day who are eligible. They have the money, but they just like, oh, but I love my job. I don't want to leave my flight attendant job. So you definitely have to be ready. All right, so eligibility. Um, in order to retire, you have to have at least 10 years of company seniority based on your date of hire. And your age plus your company seniority must equal 65 or more. That's what the company refers to as the 65 point plan. And that is their criteria for retirement eligibility. So say you start your job later in life and you're you work five years or 10 years, well, eight years and you're 65 already. Uh, you still have to get the 10 years of company seniority before you're eligible to retire. So it's not just the age plus the years of service, but you have to have that 10 years of company seniority. All right, Patrick, uh, you want to talk to us about money? Sure. Money is one of my favorite topics. 
Um, when you're doing long range planning, there are two major questions you have to answer. One is, how much do I need to have saved on the day I retire to last me the rest of my life, the goal? You know, and that's one of the most common questions we get. Well, what, what, what should I have in my 401k or my savings to retire? And that's different for everybody. I mean, if you, you know, you married a, a vice president of a Fortune 100 company, you're going to have a different number than some of us that didn't marry quite as well. So um, you have to figure out, and that's what a financial planner is really helpful with, is that that's what they do. They figure out what your number is, what's your target. And then once you've got that target in mind, you figure out how much do I need to save each year between now and then to get to that goal. Uh, as Kim says, you may find out you're there now. And now you just have to worry about is whether or not you're ready. Uh, or you may find out, you know what? I'm probably going to pass and make Patrick start a new bucket on his chart and how long I've got to go on my goal. So if you think of retirement soon and you haven't begun to address these questions, um, you're going to have, I think, believe corporate speak is challenges uh, because you may be here longer than you would like. The general goal is you want to maintain the same lifestyle you had when you were working. And my problem with that is that I'm really tired of being poor. I'd like to be one of those wealthy retirees I see jetting off on vacation to the islands and using my Silver Sneakers membership to go down to the gym. But apparently that's not the plan. Apparently the plan is to maintain the same lifestyle I've had. So if you're going to retire at age 67, the first question you have to ask is, how long am I going to live? What? 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 Well, come on. What kind, of, what kind of question is that, really? How long am I going to live? Well, the problem is that's the first of our answers. And that's not an answer. Come on. It's a, and, and that's going to be the most frustrating part about retirement planning is that we want the right answer. And, and there really isn't. Um, there's a guess. There, I call them guesstimates. There's, there's an educated opinion. There is a um, most likely to, statistically likely, um, but I like to just call them guesstimates. Well, how long am I going to live? Your life expectancy in 2022, we're still waiting on the, uh, the guesses for 2023, is going to be 77.3 years. This is the third year in a row that our life expectancy of Americans has declined. Thank you, COVID. And thank you, opioid epidemic. As a matter of fact, 2020 had the largest decline since World War II which there was some shortening of life expectancy. Something was going on back then. So yeah, however, that's only 74.5 for men and 80.2 for women. I, uh, yeah, I don't know how we let that happen. I mean, if we allegedly run the world, shouldn't we have rigged it so that we live longer? I don't know. Anyway, um, and it's going to be less for African-Americans, 71.8, and more for Hispanics, 78.8. And I got all of this information out of the National Biostatistics Report, Volume 4, Book 6. And I tell you, I have discovered the best cure for insomnia. You take that with you on a layover, you will sleep like a baby. <laughs> but that's just the first of our guesstimates. And the problem with it is it's just an average. Half of us will die sooner and half of us will die later. Your challenge is to figure out what half you're going to be in. I love telling this story. I started going gray in high school. Oh, it was terrible because, you know, you're trying to fit in. Here I am in high school getting gray hair. It was awful. I went home one day and I said, hey, mom, I discovered in biology class today that my gray hair is all your fault. Everything about a man's hair comes on his mother's genes. So what's going to happen next? Am I going to go bald in college? I mean, did any of my uncles or grandfathers or anybody go bald early? So, honey, none of them ever lived that long. Good to know. I think I know which half I'm in. Which half are you in? Because that's going to drive an awful lot of your decisions. And we'll see that repeated throughout this. But there are other guesstimates, not just age. It's like salary projection because we know wages always go up. Uh, unless you're in the airline industry. Oh. Um, how about inflation? Because we know inflation always goes up. Well, except for the last 11 years, but we're catching up on that. We're making up for lost time. And how about the stock market returns? I don't even want to talk about it. So yeah, so much for having good solid answers. What we get is good guesstimates. And again, it's really good to talk to a financial planner about that.
So you got that all done. I have the hardest question of all. Are you ready to retire? You know, we talk to a lot of people who, who call in with some new way that the company's figured out to screw them. And when we get that problem solved, I said, oh, wait a minute, I got a question for you. Did did you retire at the right time? Was it was it good for you? I mean, you're and like 98, 99% were like, oh, it's the best thing I ever did. I don't know why I waited so long. My life is so full. I don't know how I ever had time to go to work. I'm like, yeah, I don't want to talk to you. I want to talk to the one or two percent that aren't happy. Why aren't they happy? What happened? Because, you know, I don't want to make the same mistakes. And almost inevitably, um, they are not happy because they didn't plan. You know, it's, oh, $40,000, man, that'll last me the rest of my life. I'm out of here. Yeah, not so much. Or they took the sudden out. The sudden out? Yeah, the sudden out. You know, that's where the your supervisor and your union rep meet you on the jet bridge. And as you're walking up the jet bridge, the union rep says, I got your retirement. I recommend you take it. Oh. Or or actually, the one that, that happens much more commonly is your body says, no. You get injured at work, and you just can't go back to work. So... Yeah. Or you Are get you... that one passenger that, yeah. you know, yanks your chain and you're just like, supervisor, I need to retire tomorrow <laughs> or you might be seeing me in the news. <laughs> That's right. I'm going to be the next viral video if I don't get out of here. Yes. So the question is, are you ready to retire? And, you know, we're flight attendants, so we're going to ask uh, everybody. Um, we're going to talk to our, our sisters, our buddy bidders. Um, and they're all going to tell us the answer that's right for them because they don't know what's right for you. Only you will know. And I had a flight attendant uh, uh, tell me that she said, you know, um, before I retired, I started having echoes of the question, should I, should I not? It's kind of a irrevocable sort of decision. And I remembered I had those same feelings when I decided to become a flight attendant. Do I really want to do that? I mean, that's such a weird job. I mean, my life will change so dramatically, but I really want to do it. And she said, that seems to work out pretty good. And I'm pretty sure that my decision to retire, I just knew that it was time. So question is, have you reached that point? Questions? Yes. Okay. What are restrictions to the VOP if I need to change or cancel a booking? If it's the confirmed travel. I will take that one. So for the VIA positive space passes, um, there's a little rule that says uh, if you cancel the VIA travel less than 14 days prior to your depart departure, the tickets will be forfeited. So you want to cancel um, before two weeks out if possible. Now, there are some extenuating circumstances that have occurred. People have had a family emergency, um, flights cancel, weather issues, the tour company goes bankrupt, things like that. And if something like that happens after, you know, the 14 day out deadline for canceling your travel, you would need to send information about those extenuating circumstances um, to, um, what is it? Nonrev travel is it nonrev dot travel or I think it's nonrev dot travel nonrev dot travel at aa dot com and they will review the situation and in most cases I would say you know if the situations circumstances are compelling enough they will um, reinstate your VIOP passes but try if you can if something's coming up, you know, somebody gets sick or something to do it more than the 14 days out. So you don't have to worry about that. Thanks, Kim. Um, retired flight attendant, I received a 1099B from computer share regarding equity distribution. Well, I get a W-2 from AA as well. Thank you. You should not um, because W-2 is earned wages and the 1099B is the uh, the proceeds from the sale of the share. Um, I think people got both. They got both? Okay. Because they got a W-2 based oh. on the taxable value of the shares at the time they were issued. And then if the shares have been sold since that time, then they got the 1099B. That's Pretty right. sure. And the last distribution, um, they, they, they distributed them immediately, sold them, and uh, Put the money in as taxes so uh, we didn't get checks but 
the 1099 shows the, the sale, the W-2 shows the deposit of the federal taxes. So yeah, because that's right, that's earnings. Uh, from previous virtual meetings, someone said page 36 for QUIPSA form. I have gone online to retirement and can't find it. I'll take that one. It is in the retirement um, packet that you have to print up and download. And when we uh, redid the APFA website, we made the retirement packet into our web page, but we neglected to have a downloadable copy on there. That's going to get uh, fixed in the next week or so. Because I might be uploading it right now. Okay. okay. So, okay. so, so this I, is on top so of So you upload the, you were download the packet and print it. It's on that page of the packet. Did you double check? Okay. Still page 36, or you can get it from JetNet if you go to um, the retiree, the retirement forms on JetNet. It's available there as well. So. And I'll just think in two cam for that individual form. Wherever it slots in on the page itself, we can have that pulled out and have it as a link. Okay. Um, but before the second is over today, we're going to have the retirement handbook on the page uh, on the website. I will share my screen um, once it's up and show you where to find it. Right. Perfect. Yeah, I discussed that with the webmaster Good. yesterday. All right, perfect. So, uh, is uh, is that also available on the Fidelity if you have a LAA pension? I don't know if it bumps you back to JetNet okay. or if it's on Fidelity, but I know it's on JetNet still in retirement form. So. Perfect. All right. Um, next question. How soon is vacation paid off after retiring? All right. I you used to say 30 days, but now I've, I've seen a couple that have been like six weeks after retirement, so I, I'll give a range between 30 days and a month and a half after you retire, you'll see that pay out for your vacation time. The sick time should be paid out on your last actual paycheck of hours and things. So it's like your last paycheck and then your final paycheck, which has the vacation on it. Okay, okay good. We are good to continue. All right. Yeah, what do I get in retirement? Okay, so what do you get in retirement? Well, you get your travel privileges. That's the biggie. Most people hang out for the 65 point plan eligibility in order to get those travel privileges. Uh, you get paid for your vacation and sick time if you're eligible for the 65 point plan. Vacation's contractual, so you get paid for that regardless, but the sick time is linked to being eligible for the 65 point plan. Um, you get a retirement gift, fabulous. You get the status of being an AA retiree. And you get the option to purchase some really, really expensive medical insurance um, if you retire between the ages of 55 and 65 before you're eligible for Medicare. So the travel, you get your D1, D2R, D2P, D3, AA 20 and 20% 20 off Advantage tickets just pretty much like you did as an active employee other than the dreaded D2R. Um, all your non-REV travel is now booked through non-REV travel planner on the AA retiree site rather than JetNet. And that site is www.retirees.aa.com. Um, so service charges, uh, pretty much when we started doing this, the credit cards weren't always a given, but now anytime somebody is traveling and there are service charges, they're going to ask you to enter a credit card to take care of those service charges. And a pro tip is if you've got a D3 traveler, have them enter their own credit card information. That way you don't have to pay for it and then chase them down for the money. All right, Zed Fair is booked through My ID Travel, also on the AA Retirees website. There's no jump seat authority anymore. This is a biggie and no KCM. I'll never get on. I know, I'll never get on. What are we going to do? And uh, what's this? Oh, there are some non rev friendly travel agencies. Uh, a lot of the big cruise lines. Uh, go through Perks and Dark Gall. And uh, Ron Havers used to say, if you're feeling down, book one of those trips on Perks or Dargall, and you'll be like the youngest, cutest person on the trip, and it'll make you feel much better. 
So he recommends that highly. Um, also, unfortunately, uh, TSA pre-check, you're going to have to pay for them for yourself after you retire and your global entry. But if it's close to renewing that and you haven't notified your manager yet that you're going to retire, try and get the company to uh, and to renew it one more time before you retire. All right, sick time and vacation. So your unpaid, sick, unused and uh, unused and accrued sick time is paid out at a rate of, oh no, that's just sick time. Your unused sick time is paid out at a rate of $8.65 per hour, which sucks because you know when you use your sick time for a legitimate reason while you're still working, you're paid based on your trip value for the most part. So um, we always suggest that people try and use their sick time for a legitimate reason prior to their retirement. Unused and accrued vacation is paid out at four hours per day at your rate of pay, or if it's less than seven days in a vacation that you have left, it would be paid out at six, um, what is it? three hours and 50 cents per day at your rate of pay. So most people have at least the seven days of vacation when they retire. Um, this is the part I was having trouble seeing. That's a, that, that, uh, those days are not, that, that, that payout is not oh, yeah. eligible. For your the pay match from your employer will not apply to this payout of your sick time, but your personal 401k match will apply. So a lot of people, um, choose to up their um, 401k amount prior to the vacation payout. That way, more of it goes into your 401k. And uh, if you're doing the regular 401k, you can, can avoid paying taxes on that all at once. All right, your retirement gift. So you contact your flight service manager within the last 30 days of your employment. This is basically when you're going to notify your manager anyway of your intention to retire and remind them to request your retirement gift catalog. The catalog comes with a commemorative certificate of your years of service. Make sure they get it right. Um, also, options include a wide array of dust catchers, uh, some flax, you know, crystal, airplane tail, jewelry from Tiffany's. Um, so you get to choose. It's kind of like a mini sky mall. And there's an example of the fabulous crystal tail. And Patrick, you have something to say about that, don't you? You know, having a pretty <laughs> tail around the house is always good. <laughs> <laughs> Not such a bad thing. Also, your status is going to change. You're going to go from being known as a sky goddess to wait for it. Well, at least when Patrick and I retire, we're going to be known as cat ranchers. That's my goal. We both have kitties, and so some of you guys might be puppy herders, or you might <laughs> do other things, but uh, we like to make the joke about cat ranchers, because that will be us. <laughs> All right. Other things about your status, um, your retiree um, ID comes with that as well. And you could submit an online request for your retiree ID prior to your retirement, or you can wait and request the retiree ID um, from the retiree's website. Once, once you get on there, it's up in the right-hand corner. It says, need a retiree ID? Click here. All right, you can use it for discounts on shipping your FedEx discount, for example, hotels, car rentals. Um, the one thing you don't really need it for is uh, non-revving. People go, I need to non-rev right away and I don't have my retiree ID. You don't need it. Just like if you forget your AA ID, you can use your passport and your driver's license. Any government issued ID will do. So, um, But then how do they know I'm special? They may not know you're special, but I'm sure you'll tell them, right? I'm an AA retiree. I just retired with 30 or 40 or 25 years with the company, and then they'll treat you well and give you wine, hopefully. <laughs> All right. So um, access to the AA retirees website is one of those perks. You go there and you'll find everything you need to know as a retiree. Again, the website's www.retirees.aa.com. And your payroll information will be there because, hey, you still need to do your taxes, unfortunately. Um, the current employee pay portal and also 
archive of e-paid and paperless pay if you need to look at those things. So that was uh, before 10-15 of 2020. Also, um, if you need your detailed sequence history, your HI threes, you know, you need to print that up before you retire because that's not going to be available on the retirees website. All right. So some people go, hey, I, I don't want I can't retire. I'm not eligible, but I'm at it. I'm out of here. Well, guess what? You can just quit. In order to quit, hey, you just uh, you have notice to your flight service manager. Your vacation will be paid out because that's contractual. And if you qualify for a pension, you'll still have your pension. Patrick used to always say, hey, if you stole a 747 and got put in jail, they would still have to give you your pension. So, you know, regardless of whether you're qualified to be a retiree, if you have a pension, if you're one of those lucky enough, you will still have your pension. That pretty much applies for the 401k as well. Absolutely. All right. If you're a LAA person, you'll need to contact the Pension Service Center at AA in order to commence that pension when you're ready. If you're a former U.S. Airways flight attendant, um, you would contact the PBGC to commence your pension if you're eligible for a pension. And uh, since you're not retiring, unfortunately, you would not be paid out for any unused sick time. But we're all going to use it before we either retire or resign, so that shouldn't be an issue. All right. Time for more questions, if we've got any more. And if not, we just keep rolling to the end. We do. OK, should I bid all my vacation seven day increments to be paid the full amount? That's that's not retirement. That's regular vacation bidding. And uh, the answer is yes. Yeah. If you want to be paid the full amount, you've got to do it at least in seven day increments. Now for retiring, if you have a block of five and you have a block of seven and another block of three, it's going to be based on your total vacation when you retire. So you don't really have to worry about that so much as far as getting paid out at the full rate when you retire because they base it on your total number of vacation days at the time of retirement. You know, and we we have a lot of vacation days that we don't think about that, that pop up when we retire. Right now, we're doing vacation bidding for the next vacation year based on what I've accrued uh, in 2022, but I haven't been awarded the February, March, which I'll probably end up being assigned, uh, the vacation days yet. <laughs> But I've earned them. So if I were to retire tomorrow, not only would I be paid out for the April vacation for this year that I, I bid but haven't taken yet, but I'd also get paid all of those days I accrued in 2022 but haven't been awarded yet. So I not only get my unused, but I get my accrued and not awarded. And so for most of us, it's going to be really hard to have less than seven days of vacation when you add those all together. Mm -hmm. So this is a great segue to the website. Um, in regards to the vacation bidding itself, so if you go to APFA.org, um, we have a new, we actually just uh, launched the newly designed website in December. We built many, many pages that we didn't have before to help you navigate a lot of different things that um, go into our jobs. For example, we have this new bidding section to help you de navigate bidding um, different sections. Uh, we've got a page for ETB, but under uh, bidding, uh, uh, let's see, under bidding, we do have a tab right here for vacation bidding. Um, so if you go here, you can read some more information about vacation. Um, but today, since we're talking about retirement, under resources, we have a retirement page. If you are using a mobile device, you can also, um, the navigation looks a little bit different than on the desktop, so I'm going to make it look like we're on a, uh, a phone. Okay. <laughs> so you're going to use this little hamburger menu. Make me hungry. <laughs> and then under resources, there's retirement. That's one way to get to it, or you use the hamburger and hit this little drop down, and then you can click on retirement. Okay, and we have the good side packet right here. Already on there. It's there. Yay. Click on it. It'll open for you, and then you can download it or print it off. 
or you um, can just print the good go to the page where the quipsa form is and yeah print that, that quipsa form 36 is page 36 so for the individual who asked that question it is up there now you can um, print off page 36 um, and just remember the Quipsa form because I know there's a lot of confusion of it out there and maybe more senior people are telling more junior people you need to fill it out. It's only applied to legacy AA flight attendants who were hired prior to 2012 and have a legacy AA pension. So okay. other than that, you don't have to worry about it. Those are the only group of people that would need to fill out that form. Yeah, it doesn't have anything to do with your 401k. So, no. Yeah. So your 401k, you always put a beneficiary down, and that's totally separate. Okay, good. So also on this page, um, we have it broken down by subject. So you can click on the area that you were interested in. I think I did a, a find for Quipsa. So on retirement income, when you get down to this portion, it is broken down by American Airlines 401k, and then there's a section for I know we have it broken down very, mm -hmm. uh, very basic for you to walk through. Very yeah. cool. OK, next question. How do I determine what amount my pension will be when I retire? And do I have to be a certain age to collect it? Well, while well, you're there in the uh, uh, good slide, Josh, if you will go to. Um, how do I estimate my page 16? 16, let's go to it. Page 16 of the packet, and it's in there. And this is uh, for the LAA pension. And uh, you go to the Fidelity website. And if you have an LAA pension, you will have an additional tab in your Fidelity uh, netbenefits.com slash AA website, which is your pension. And you can click on that and get an estimate. It's going to ask you a couple of questions. It's going to ask you what day do you want to stop working? And as long as that's tomorrow or later, that's great because your pension's not growing based on additional work. So that's just cool. And then it's going to ask when do you want to start your pension. And those are really separate. I mean, you may leave at age 55 and not start your pension until 65. So those are totally separate questions. And then it's going to ask, hey, if you want to share your pension, what's the birth date of the person you want to share it with? And the sad news is the younger they are, the more it hurts your current pension, but it'll take that. It'll Sorry, take that. you <laughs> cougars out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many of them, so many. Um, and uh, that it'll come back and it'll give you an estimate. And it, it's all the choices you, you will have under your pension. And we'll talk about some of those choices in just a minute. But the cool thing is you get down to the bottom and I say, well, that's great. What happens if instead of leaving at 60, I left at 62? And you can rerun it at 62, and you can rerun it at 70, you can rerun it at 80. If you're rerunning it at 85, let me know and we'll talk. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, so that's how you get your estimate. If you have a, a PBGC pension, uh, you go to pbgc.gov, click on My PBA. Why is PBA in that PBGC? I don't know, but you click on the My PBA and it will uh, allow you to request a pension estimate. They will ask the same questions, but this is government, so it's not online and doesn't calculate it there, but they'll mail it to you in a couple of weeks. Is that mean for the P the second one that you said in here? Yes. Yes. Well, yeah. the website information is in there. Okay. I only see the... Um... I think it's before that. Okay. But it is I think here. we talk about the PBGC pensions first and then go to the... Oh, here it is. There it is. There it is. So uh, the, the pre preceding page, page 15, has that information as well. All right. Okay, good. Thank you, Patrick. You're welcome. Um, all right. I have given my supervisor my retirement date of 7-6-23. When exactly does the company match of my 401k show or when do they apply their match to my account? I do have a financial company that works with Fidelity. I'm going to roll my money over to them to manage. Don't know if they uh, OK, great. OK, that's a lot to unpack. Let's let's work backwards. First off, um, you don't have to roll your 401k out when you leave. You can just leave as long as you've got more than $5,000. And if you don't have more than $5,000, you should talk to a planner about whether or not it's time to leave. Uh, but if you've got more than $5,000, you can just leave it and manage it right there, Fidelity. Um, there are some advantages to that because our, our 401k plan is huge. I mean, we've got 
like 180,000 members, which means that when you take the overhead and divide it, um, our, our burden, our co your cost, what you're paying for all of that management is pretty small compared to some of the, some of the other options. Um, and I couldn't tell from your question there, but Fidelity does have a financial advising department and uh, they are more than happy to uh, have you pay them to manage your money for you. There is at least a dozen uh, advisors out there that I can think of off the top of my head that would be happy to, to you know, take your money and, and invest it for you. And uh, that's always an option, but you should know that leaving it where it is and not paying all of those new fees when you roll it over, because when you roll it over, you'll pay new fees, um, is, is always an option. The uh, when the 401k match, it's not like it's not different from any other paycheck. When you receive your last paycheck, not the confused with the final paycheck, <laughs> they're different. Uh, when you receive your last paycheck, any 401k match you're eligible for will show on that paycheck. All right. And another thing, if you're considering retiring on July 6th, you might want to think about changing that date to July 1st if you have a pension because the pensions only pay on the first of every calendar month. And if, and if you retire on July 6th, you're gonna miss the pension payment for the month of July. You don't have to do that. It might be an anniversary date or a birthday or something, but uh, just keep in mind if you're eligible for a pension and you're retired on July 1st, you'd be eligible for a pension payment for the month of July. So you're saying I could, leave on July 1st and get a July payment, assuming I'm eligible. I may not be eligible for like a birthday. Or right, exactly. Or I could wait and retire on like July 30th, still get my August 1st first pension check, and I have my health care all the way through July. 30th. Right. Another reason to retire at the end of the month, uh, but it could be your Medicare eligibility date that you're waiting for or something like that, but that would also be the first of the month. Um, but yeah, your insurance ends at midnight on the night, your last night as an active employee. So if you want your insurance to carry through the end of the month, um, you should probably retire, have the last day as an active employee be the last day of a calendar month and the first day as a retiree be the first day of the next calendar month. But if you're going on your spouse's insurance or something like that, it may not matter. It may not matter. So it depends on your individual situ situation and, you know, but it's just something to think about. Yeah, think about pension, Social Security, and Medicare always start on the first of the month. Uh, if you if you have a life event and you're transferring to someone else's insurance, you'll have to deal with it, whoever their insurance company is to see if you can start mid-month. At the life events, you usually do allow you to start mid-month. Yeah, yeah. So in this scenario, um, they asked, should I wait till July 31st or August 1st instead? Yeah. Um, July, <laughs> yeah. Either. July 31st could be your last day as an active employee if you want your insurance to run through the end of the month. And then uh, August 1st would be your first day as a retiree and your pension would commence on August 1st in that situation. And, and if you're leaving at the uh, the end of the drive carefully on that last day, I'm just you know, so. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's all we have for right now. Thank you. Perfect. All right. We were just talking about money. Let's talk about money income. <clears throat> In retirement, you're going to have several sources of income. Uh, you're going to have your 401k. You're going to have an IRA. You're going to have social security. And uh, if you, you're, you're going to have savings, and savings is actually kind of a, a whole bunch of stuff that we don't think of as savings, but we'll talk about that. And then if you have a pension, you'll have a pension as well. And it's always good to have these multiple streams of income. And I like to think of it as having like a five-legged stool, because that means that you're getting all these different streams of income, and it, you're a whole lot more stable, a whole lot less subject to, uh, to risk. And I contrast that to all of the people that uh, there's like 50 percent of the people on social security that that's all they have is social security and i don't know how secure uh social security is if your entire your financial entire financial life depends on the good graces of the united states congress every time i see this list and see that i have all of these options i'm so grateful that i'm in a unit 
unionized workforce and the union worries about making sure that we have all of these options and all of these uh, ways that we can be more ready for retirement. Hey, what about my 401k loan? Well, hey, if you've got a 401k loan, you've got a couple of options. The first is just continue to pay the loan back on the current amortization schedule. You don't have a paycheck to uh, have the deduction taken from, but they'll be glad to make it an ACH and auto deducted from your checking account every month. Or you can just let it slide, stop making payments, and uh, the outstanding balance will be posted as a distribution, which is really a bad thing. And uh, because not only we tax his income, if you're not yet 59 and a half, you also have to pay the penalty. And oh, by the way, you're not, you know, you're not earning money in there. Don't do it. Pay the loan back and let it continue to earn tax free. All right. One last thing to remember about that 401k is that um, your 401k will freeze for the first 30 days of your after your exit from the company. I mean, freeze. You can't. You can't put money in. You can't take money out. You can't change your investment options. It just frozen. So if you're going to need money in the first 30 days, you might want to consider taking a little roll a little bit out just prior to leaving uh, so that you don't have to wait the 30 days freeze to expire. I also want to point out if you need money out of your 401k in the first 30 days of retirement, you may not quite be ready. Talk to a financial planner before you do that. Yeah. Um, you can, we talk, like we talked about before, you can roll your 401k into an IRA um, and uh, a lot of financial planners would be really happy to have you do that because when you sell the, the shares of whatever in your 401k and buy new shares in the IRA, they make a commission on the new sale. So they'd be more than happy to have you roll hundreds of thousands of dollars into the IRA and make, make a commission on all that. Uh, it may be a smart idea. It may not be the smartest idea. You want to talk to a financial planner who is not going to get that commission. If your financial planner is the one that's going to get that commission, yeah, go talk to a financial planner who's who you know how they're getting paid and they they don't have a best interest in the decisions you make. Or like we said before, you can just leave it with Fidelity and manage it through there. Hey, IRAs. We talked about uh, the pre-tax, just like our pre-tax uh, 401k. There's the post-tax Roth um, IRA, which is just like our Roth 401k. The Roth IRA was the original Roth. Um, however, with the IRA, there are some income limits. If you are uh, make 138000 or more as a single person and 218000 as a married person, you are not allowed to make IRA contributions. I got a call from my uh, neighbor the other day. He says, they won't let me make contributions to my 2022 IRA. They're taking it all back out and sending it back to me. I'm like, it's because you make too much money, dude. Cry me a river. Yeah. All right. And then uh, conversion. You can uh, convert your 401k into an IRA, but once you've retired, you can't go back. So it's kind of a, a loosey goosey before you retire. But once you've retired, you can't roll your IRA back into a 401k. So once again, you know, it may be a great idea to roll it over. It may not. Just make sure you know what you're doing and what you're giving up. Because um, there are different advantages to the 401k and the IRA. Uh, for instance, the way your kids inherit an IRA are different than the way your kids or whoever your beneficiaries are inherit your 401k. So you want to review those before you make changes between the type of investment. We tend to think they're you know, the same thing, 401k, IRA, they're all tax deferred, whatever. But they're actually, they're really very different. The 401k is a product of federal law, and as a result of that, it has covered under ERISA, the Employee uh, Retirement Income Security Act, and that brings with it a whole bunch of, of good protections. For instance, it's 100% creditor protected. What? Yeah, 100% creditor If somebody's suing you and trying to get your money, say you run over the name of Chihuahua, and they sue you, and they win, and they get everything you've got, they can't touch your 401k. It is 100% creditor protected. However, if you've rolled it over into an IRA, the protection in the IRA depends on what state you live in because the IRA is a product of state law. So each state has different rules on what portion you get. I think it's Michigan, of all places, good unionized workforce, um, that has like the first $50,000 you get to keep, the grieving Chihuahua owner gets the rest of your IRA. So you want to make sure uh, what 
what you're rolling, what you're changing your products into that you know what you're getting. All right. Questions? We're rolling on. We are. Um, there seems to be a little bit of confusion about the difference between the last day of the month and the first day of the month. Could you clarify that? Yes, um, the last day of the month can be your last day as an active employee. The first day of the month will be the first day of, as a retiree. So you say, I'm retiring on the first. My last day is the last day of the month. So um, you can't be both an active and a retired employee on the same day. So you're going to be active on the last day of the month. You're going to be a retiree on the first. OK, so my last day as an employee is the last day of the month. And my first day as a retiree is the first day of the subsequent month. And then what is that? Um, I do not, I'm not understanding retirement on the first and 31st, but the frozen payment amount. Can you explain more? Frozen payment. That, that's the pensions that were frozen, probably the legacy AA or the PBGC pensions. All of the pensions, both PBGC and the legacy AA pension only pay they only issue checks on the first of the calendar month so if you're retired and being retired is dependent on the company saying hey we're going to send this uh, notification to the admin department and we're going to code you rt which is retired as of this day so if you tell your supervisor hey i want to be an active employee through the 31st of july for example um, that means your health care insurance and everything, every benefit you get as an active employee goes to the end of that day, midnight, you know, mm -hmm. and then you're coded RT the next day and you're now a retiree. So everything you're going to get as a retiree, you get effective that day, which includes the ability to commence your pension if you're eligible for a pension. So in that way, you're able to maximize your company benefits up until the end of that month. Right. Okay. So that and you're not you don't have any laps in coverage. Exactly. Have anything everything. Like that. And yeah. if you're going on COBRA, your COBRA, you'd be eligible for COBRA effective the very next day. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, that there is a little bit of an admin time because you can't actually enroll in COBRA. The trigger to be offered the COBRA is your retirement. So you can't do that ahead of time. All of us Type A people would like to do it ahead of time and be organized, but uh, we're not able to do that. So we have to wait till we retire. That triggers the COBRA eligibility, and then we have to do it as quickly as possible after we retire, usually within uh, 24 to 48 hours. So, so to, but we'll talk more about that later in the presentation. So to be clear with the last day of the month and the first day of the month, the benefit of doing it is to, it's because of benefits. So it's because of, if you have a pension, if you say retired on the fifth of the month, if you'd retired four days earlier, you could have got a pension payment for that month. Got it. So basically, and don't save it and put it on the back end after you're dead. If you don't have a pension, you don't have to worry about it, except you may want to have your insurance through the end of the month and then go on something new at and the beginning of the day. Right. Immediately after that day. Right. Yeah, right. Okay, good. Clear. Cool. So that's it. All right. Jim, tell us about Social Security. Okay, I never thought I'd have to talk about Social Security. I'm much too young, and I remember my grandparents sitting around and talking about their Social Security, and they were also talking about all their aches and pains, and I was like, please don't ever let me sit around and talk about that. But hey, I'm about, yeah. I'll try not to tell you about my aching back too much, though. All right, so Social Security may be taken as early as age 62 and as late as age 70. Um, there's no increase after age 70, so it really doesn't make sense to wait. You're leaving money on the table if you wait until after age 70 to commence your Social Security benefits. Um, www.ssa.gov is the Social Security website. You can go there and set up your ssa.gov account and do estimates. Well, you know, figure out what you're going to get in Social Security if you retire early at age 62. If you were to start your Social Security at age 67 or whenever your normal Social Security age is or age 70. So you can look at the different amounts and see, you know, what's going to be best for you for your planning purposes. 
Um, married couples have some complicated decisions to make about when and how to draw their social security. So if you're single, I don't know, you have like nine different options for taking your social security, but multiply that if you're married to have 81 different options. So that's why we say, please talk to a social security advisor. Um, there are also apps if you're a geek like Patrick and you can go online and download an app which will show you how to optimize those social security benefits. Um, but please, please uh, talk to an expert. All right, so early Social Security at age 62. We're going to talk about some pros and cons of starting your Social Security early. Um, one pro is that you get more years of payments, so that could be a good thing. Um, another pro, um, you can get the money if you no. need it. So if you're 62, you were planning on waiting a little bit longer, but something's happened, something's come up in your life and you need to retire now. Huh? Well, you can get the money if you need it now, so that's a good thing. Um, and one con is that you're going to have lower payments for the rest of your life. Starting it earlier, it's kind of like with the pensions we'll talk about later. You're stretching your money out over more years, so it lowers your payments somewhat. Another con is that you're subject to income limits until you reach your full Social Security age. So, for example, in 2023, um, you can earn, what is it, 23,000, 20, and if you only earn that or less, you're fine. If you earn more than that, you're going to be deducting $1 of benefits for every $2 you make over and above that limit. So, Wait, I just said the math in my head. That's less than the 40 hours. If I'm flying my 40 hours, I'm going to be paying that. One dollar exactly. benefit. Oh. So if you're going to keep working and even just flying the top 40, you're going to definitely uh, lose out if you start your Social Security early at age 62. So not necessarily the best idea. Um, it's usually the people that we see that have to retire a little bit earlier because of a medical issue or something, or maybe they're spouses working and making the big bucks and they decide to retire early and start their social security early. I we want, we want to do them. I, 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 <laughs> okay, so the break even point with early social security versus regular social security is the average age of death, age 78 and a half or something like that, 79. So we're at 77. Oh yeah, all those uh, COVID and Drug oh, addiction yeah. issues has lowered the average age of death in our country, which is sad. All right, so that's the big question. When are you going to die? And as Patrick mentioned earlier, we have to do that. So we have to make an educated guess. So if you look at these two lines on the chart, um, the blue line is somebody starting their Social Security early at age 62. And then the um, red line is someone starting at age 66 which for some people is regular Social Security. A lot of us these days, if you were born after 1960, 1960 or after, you have to wait till age 67. But um, so the lines cross at the average age of death, which is now 77-ish. So that's kind of the break even point. So if you think you're going to live quite a few years beyond age 77, you might want to wait. But if you need to start now because you have to retire earlier than you planned, Taking it early at 62 is an option. Um, you know, my grandmother was driving when she was in her early 90s. My uncle just turned 90 and he's still chauffeuring around everybody in his retirement community. So uh, probably taking it later would have been the best idea for him. I haven't asked him what he did yet, but I will. <laughs> Patrick, on the other hand, had some uncles that you know, died before they found out if they were going to have gray hair or not. So yeah. they probably should have started it early. As early as possible. As early as possible. Okay, so um, a lot of people want to know, when's my full Social Security age? You know, SSNRA means full Social Security. And, and there's some special um, rule if you start your... Uh, social Security, when you reach your full Social Security age, right? right? If that's in the middle of the year or something. And I'm going to let Patrick explain it because he explains it a little bit better than I do. All right. So one of the one of the things is if 
if say my full social security age is 67 and I turn 67 in say August and I'm going to start my social security, well, uh, I decide I'm going to start my social security say in January of that year, which I'm turned 67. Well, I'm now, because I'm not in 67, I'm subject to that $21,000 was it uh, income cap, except the year in which you turn full social security normal retirement age, uh, we give you a special cap instead of that twenty-one thousand. We give you a cap of fifty-eight thousand five hundred twenty dollars. The higher cap. higher cap because we know you're going to continue to work part of that year. And um, the only, I mean, that helps. If I'm going to turn sixty-seven in July, I'm probably not going to earn fifty-eight thousand before I turn sixty-seven. After I turn sixty-seven. We just ignore all that income. But if you turn 67 in December, uh, you wait till January exactly, 1st. Exactly, right? exactly, because now I may have earned way more than the 58,000 by December. And so I'm going to be subject to that cap. So you want to sit down and just do the math. Am I better off to go ahead and start my Social Security early in the year in which I turn 67? Or should I wait until I'm into the next next year? So yeah, it's a it's a interesting issue. Talk to an expert. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And uh, you know, we're talking about when is your full SSNRA, and here's the chart. And uh, like Kim was saying, everyone 1960 and later has 67. All right. Hey, what counts as earnings? When we're talking about that 21,000 and 58,000, what what really is earnings? And uh, earnings include income from wages or net earnings of self-employment. So. Um, they also include like bonuses, commissions, and severance pay. Ooh, severance pay, yeah. So we've seen that in the past, and uh, that can push you over that fifty-one or fifty-eight thousand dollar limit. So again, you'll want to talk to a financial planner about it. But I've got good news about earnings. Um, earnings do not include investment income. So if I'm getting income from my uh, uh, stocks and bonds, that doesn't count. My pensions doesn't count. Capital gains, inheritance don't count. Uh, so any dividends or capital gains that you're getting are not going to negatively impact your Social Security benefits directly, even if you decide to uh, file earlier than your full retirement age. Do I pay taxes on Social Security? Maybe. Uh, the good news is the first 15% of your Social Security is always tax-free. Even, even Bill Gates it's the first 15% of his Social Security tax-free, and he has no idea that's true. However, the rest of it, you may pay tax on 0, 50, or 85% of the rest, depending on what your total combined income is. Notice this is how much will be taxed, not the tax break. So here's the chart. If your total combined income is 0 to 25,000 and you're single, they don't tax any of it, and any of your Social Security. Uh, the other income is subject to regular federal income tax. And up to 34000 if you're single and have more than 34000 of combined income, then they take 85% of your Social Security and tax it at whatever your tax rate is. And uh, the state taxes, in 37 states, your Social Security is uh, state tax-free. 13 states do tax some or all of your Social Security. They are Colorado, West Virginia. So you might want to think about where am I going to live in retirement in terms of what states are going to tax my Social Security and also your pension? Uh, different states tax pensions differently. So that's one of the things you want to investigate when you're thinking about moving to warmer or colder climate. Savings. Uh, in addition to cash, stocks, and bonds, which we normally think of as savings, you also have hidden savings. For instance, home equity. You may have a lot of equity built up in your home and you no longer need, you know, 3,000 square feet of housing because, you know, it's just you and the spouse. Um, so you may be able to downsize and take some of that home equity and use that as some of your savings. Um, life insurance. And by that, I mean, if there's a cash value, not what you get if your spouse mysteriously falls down the stairs. And also not what you get from AA, which is term life insurance. And you would have to choose to continue that at a much higher rate when you retire. Correct. Right. This is just if you uh, if you have a, uh, they call it whole life or cash accumulation, uh, life insurance, and you can borrow against it. That's That's another form of savings. Hey, Kim, we're talking about pensions. What do you need to tell us about 
pensions depending on where I came from. OK, so if you have a pension, it is going to be dependent on which carrier you started your career with prior to the merger. Um, there are no pensions for anyone that was uh, hired after the merger, unfortunately. Um, but we're working on beefing up the 401k for everybody. I think the negotiators talked about that yesterday in their, in their meeting. So, um, so if you started with U.S. Airways, you're going to have one set of rules and with AA, legacy AA, another set of rules. Now, under the U.S. Airways umbrella, there were multiple carriers with whom you could have started out your career. And sometimes that's going to make a difference, too, on how you started your pension. Because when some of these pensions went to the PBGC, uh, they saved the rules of the pensions of those carriers. So they varied a little bit. So if you're a formal shuttle flight attendant, for example, your early pension age is age 52. Your full pension age is age 62. You can start uh, what they call double dipping at the early pension age of age 52. Um, but there's going to be a 3% reduction per year prior to age 62. At age 62, if you wait until then, um, the dreaded Social Security offset will be calculated in and you would not have, be subject to the 3% per year reduction. So um, Piedmont, Allegheny, U.S. Airways, early pension age at age 55, um, full pension age is age 62 also. For PSA flight attendants, former PSA flight attendants, uh, your early pension age at age 55. That's when you could start double dipping if you went, wanted to start early. The full pension uh, age with no reductions would be at age 65. For the legacy AA pensions, that early pension age is age 55, and the full pension age for flight attendants is age 60. So that same 3% reduction per year, if you were to commence your pension prior to age 60, would apply. However, with the AA pensions, unfortunately, because of the pension plan language, there's no double dipping, so you have to wait until you retire to commence your AA pension unless you fall into one very small loophole that only applies to people over the age of 70 and a half. So, all right, double dipping we mentioned um, that applies to the former uh, uh, U.S. Airways flight attendants, and there was a rule that went away in uh, what June of 2021 that used to permit, um, prohibit you from double dipping until you hit your full pension age. That that rule was done away with, so now you can double dip at your early pension age should you choose to do that. But again, those early uh, reductions of 3% per year prior to the full pension age would still apply. And uh, there's no reduction at the full pension age, so a lot of people wait for that. All right, so pension options. Uh, Patrick, how many different ways can I get my money? Funny you should ask how many different ways I can get my money. There are three basic ways you can get your money. Uh, you can get a single life annuity. The PBG calls this a straight life annuity. But fortunately for us in the airline industry that runs on jet fuel, caffeine, and acronyms, it's the same acronym, SLA. Um, or you can share with someone else. And, I remind you, it's nice to share, or you can get a minimum number of checks. Um, and uh, if you are a legacy AA and have a legacy AA pension, there's a fourth option, more up front, less later. Look at, let's look at those real quick. Single life annuity, you get a check every month until you're dead. And then it stops. And that's, you know, basically what most of us think about when we think about a pension. It's kind of the normal form of benefit. And, and actually, that's what we call it is the normal form of benefit. And we do that because there's um, normal needs that when they have to calculate how much money does the company have to save in the pension in order to pay you your pension when you're finally eligible for it 20, 30, 40 years later, they have to make some assumptions. They have to make some assumptions like how long are you going to live, if this sounds familiar. Uh, how long are you going to work? How much are you going to work? How much are you going to you know, how much pension you earn. And then once you do start your pension, how are you going to take it? And they assume you're going to take it as a single life annuity. And that's the number that they're fighting for. Remember, we we're talking about our target number for 401k. 
the company has to have a target number for the pension as well. And so they, they calculate that pension uh, number. And once they have that target number, um, they use that to uh, determine the, the value of all the other options out there. A single life annuity is a payment every month, and it's for life, so called a life annuity. It's for one life, yours. And so we call that the single life annuity. And so uh, that is the normal form of benefit. And once they determine the value, uh, that determines all the other payment options. Well, what about those options? Well, it's nice to share, and that means a pension for your life and someone else's life as well. So they're going to get an annuity for their life after you're gone. You never get two checks on the same month for two different people. The minute you're gone, they start sending the checks to your survivor. And they call that the survivor annuity because they only get it if they survive you. Um, and remember, it's still the same big pile of money. So if you leave them some, and you can choose to leave them 50 to 100% of what you get, not your single annuity amount because you're going to get less because you decided to leave some for someone else. Um, but the more you leave them, the less you get. Well, I suppose I'm going to have to leave something for Bozo, otherwise we're going to be living under a bridge. All right, well, I'll just take less while I'm alive and so that they got some after I'm dead. <gasps> what happens if they die first? Crap. I'm stuck at that lower monthly amount. I could have had a higher amount if I'd taken the SLA. Um, there's a technical term for that situation, and that is you're screwed. Yeah. However, we have some good news for you. There's a way to cover that risk, and that is uh, we have another option called the pop-up option. And with the pop-up option, you take a slightly lower amount for your benefit while you're alive, um, and if the joint annuitant dies first, we pop you back up to the single life annuity amount for the rest of your life as though you had never had that joint survivor. How much lower depends on the age difference between you and your uh, survivor. And most people are going to take one of these key options. And by most people, I mean like 90% plus are going to end up in either the single life annuity or the joint survivor almost always with the pop up because I know you married that 30 year old pool boy, but you know, life's uncertain and those horrible chlorine accidents happen. And so, yeah. So uh, almost always with the pop-up option. And however, there are uh, there is one other option that we have out there, and that's the guaranteed period certain. And that means I'm going to take slightly lower amount while I'm alive because I have I'm funding something, paying for something. So I need those checks to come for 10, 15, or 20 years, or five, 10, or 15 years on the LUS PBGC pensions. Um, and even if I'm dead, I need the checks to come for that minimum period. And so I'm going to take slightly less by uh, for doing it. For most people, it doesn't make sense to take less now for that period certain, unless of course you're pretty sure you're going to be dead soon. Then that might be it might be a useful idea. Again, this doesn't apply to very many people at all, but it's good to know that's out there. And then the LAA people have a fourth option, and that is a level income option, and uh, it it means that you're going to get more upfront less later on. And this typically happens where you're not eligible for Social Security. All you've got is your pension, and it's just not quite enough. Now, once Social Security kicks in, I'm going to be okay, but right now, I need more money now. AA says, we have a deal for you. We will give you more of your pension now, and then when you reach Social Security age, either age 62 or your SSNRA, we'll reduce that down so that it kind of levels out, so that your, your income over the years is pretty level. I'm not sure it's actuarial, actuarially sound, but uh, if you need the money now, and where we see this frequently is those people that took this out now. They weren't planning on retirement. They don't have enough money all lined up. It's good to know that this option is out there. Again, very few people would, would this would make sense for. So how do I apply for my pension? Hey, no earlier than 90 days before you start your pension. Oh, no, no, I need to apply six months out. Sorry. No earlier than 90 days before you want to start your pension. Uh, at LAA, you're going to reach out to the Pension Service Center at the 800 447 2000, option 134, and say, I would like my kit, AIT. And that's going to be that stack of papers that you need to fill out that's your application for your pension. You can also visit the Pension Service Center on JetNet and follow select the request for a pension on, on Fidelity. Uh, collect this. Uh, click on the uh, request your pension and follow the prompts. 
same out of same three questions you get when you do an estimate. Or if you're uh, LUS, you can contact the PPGC directly at 800-400-7242 or go to that PPGC.gov and click on the My PBA and you can make the request to start your pension on there. And once again, it's uh, it's not automated on the PPGC website yet. We hear rumors that they're working on it, but yeah. So that's how you start your pension. Are there taxes on the pension? Oh yeah, there's tax on it. Bummer. I know, I know. And you're gonna pay federal income tax on your pension as ordinary income, uh, depending on whether you're in the 10 to the 37% tax rate. Hey, how do I figure that out? Here's the tax chart for 2023. If you uh, are making uh, less than eleven thousand dollars, you can't retire. Yet. Oh no! Uh, <laughs> if you're making less than eleven thousand dollars, uh, the first eleven thousand dollars you make is going to be taxed at ten percent. The amount between eleven and thousand and forty-four thousand is going to be taxed at twelve. They never tax that first eleven thousand at twelve percent. The the it's it's stair step. It's not like the second you hit 11,001, they tax the whole thing at 12. They only tax the amount over at the higher amount. The next uh, step up is uh, uh, 44,000. You go to uh, 22%, and you'll notice that is quite a step. That is quite a step. Everything over 44,000 is taxed 10% more than the part below. And then the next step is 24 at 95,000, 182, 231. And now I don't care anymore because that's way more than I'll ever make. So, yeah. All right. Some states don't tax pensions. 14 states don't tax pensions, uh, or they only tax a portion of it. Again, you want to look at what state you're thinking about moving to and what are their tax rules before you decide to move there. Remember your mileage. Maybe these numbers are used for some mythical flight attendant and not for you. Yeah, can you give us some pension tips? I certainly can. Okay, so um, in terms of the pension tips, as we mentioned before, they can be requested from AA or the PBGC no more than 90 days out from the date you're going to commence your pension. That may also be your retirement date, but sometimes people retire early and commence their pension a little bit later. So it's basically you don't want to request it more than 90 days out from the date you plan to commence your pension, which, as we mentioned earlier, is going to be the first of a calendar month. So pensions start on the first of the calendar month, and uh, a good rule of thumb is to be done with your last trip before the end of the month, so a fly-through trip that you were going to try and work uh, would be keeping you on payroll, and you can't be retired and on payroll at the same time, so you wouldn't be able to commence your pension. So don't bid fly through or have your uh, supervisor code you uh, in time to be removed from that trip. Oh, they would never reassign me at the end of the month to extend me out my original footprint of my trip. You never know. Yeah, you never know. Supposedly, PBS won't let you do that, but sometimes we notify the manager after bids are out and we just want to make sure it's done correctly. Yeah. All right, more pension tips. Um, have copies of all divorce decrees and quadros. Now, this would be divorce decrees during the time period that you were employed by the company that the pension came from. So if you were a you know, you, former U.S. Airways, if you worked for another airline and then you got divorced before you started working for U.S. Airways, don't worry about that one. But if you were married and divorced during the time period that you worked for U.S. Airways, you would need to have those divorce decrees or quadros. And the same applies for AA. You know, if you worked, if you were married and divorced before you started working at the company, you don't worry about it. But any time after that, you would have to worry about it. Yeah. Um, if you're a widow or a widower, you'll need to provide a copy of the death certificate, especially if you want to, and you would want to have the single life annuity, but they know you've been married before, that's when you wanted to provide the death certificate. Um, also, the first month is always paid retroactively, so we talked about it starting on the Pacific calendar month, but if you retire on that day, you're not going to get your first pension payment actually on that day. They will pay you for that month, but it's going to take probably about um, four to six weeks for them to get the first pension payment out. 
So right, six to eight weeks, but I think with fidelity is a little bit quicker or so. I'm hearing it's about four to six weeks to get your first pension payment. All right, the Qualified Pre-Retirement Survivor Annuity. That is the QUIPSA form that we mentioned that um, Legacy AA uh, pension holders can uh, fill out. And basically, the federal law says your spouse automatically gets a 50% joint and survivor annuity if you were to pass away prior to commencing the pension. So this form allows you to elect to leave your spouse 100% of your pension if something happens to you if you die prior to commencing your pension. So it's a good thing to do. There's not really a downside if you don't get charged for it. There are other groups at the company that get charged for the privilege of filling out this form and having it on file that um, the flight attendants negotiated to have it at no extra charge. Go APFA. Go APFA. <laughs> good thing that get got done once upon a time. So the form can be found on JetNet in the retirement form section, or we can have it included in the retirement packet on APFA.org. Um, flight attendants are the only work group at the company that can do this, and the company pays for it. Um, one thing, you have to have been at least married for 12 months, so no deathbed marriages would apply. Bummer. <laughs> I'm married. I'd be married to somebody who leave my pension to at the last minute if I could, just if someone would get it. You're already married, so. I know. I know. All right. So, any more still, questions? There's <laughs> still time. Okay. Uh, I'm considering retirement. I'm married to an AA pilot. Will I have retirement passes and his D2 passes at that time, or do I have to choose one? You will have both, so you'll be eligible for D2R, but why would you use D2R if you're eligible for his D2 passes? So you'll probably, for D2s, just go on his passes. The good thing about that is when you retire, you get the same amount of D1s that you had as an active employee. So you'll have his D1, and he'll have your D1, so you'll have double the D1s, and that's the main benefit there. Good to know. Uh, does the company give spouses positive space on a quote last trip? I have heard that they still do that. Okay, here's, and here's what I think is the official answer. Pilots get it because APA got that as some sort of side agreement. Flight attendants used to get it, but it was just a courtesy. It's not in policy anywhere. And I think you can still get it if you request it and you have a nice supervisor that puts it, it for it. And that's the key. You have to have a nice supervisor with some, maybe a non sequitur, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but the, uh, um, yeah, you, you can ask for it. You don't have a demand right to it. I've heard of a couple of people getting it recently. Yeah, I, students, so. I had a trip last year where uh, my, my number two was retiring. Why would you do number two on your last day? My number two was <laughs> retiring and brought Added her uh, spouse and husband, and uh, I'll come along on positive face. So it was on. My plan is to retire December 15th and collect my last paycheck on the 30th. I would start my pension and social security on January 1st, 2024. Is that feasible? Yes and no. Um, here's the thing you're going to work the first of the 15th. So when do you get paid the extra part of that? January, January 15th. So yeah, the 30 won't be your last paycheck. Um, and it's still feasible. It's still feasible. Also, have you thought what we're gonna do for insurance between the 15th and the 1st? Because when you leave America on the 15th, your American insurance is gonna stop. So, I mean, you may be perfectly comfortable not having insurance for 15 days. I've seen New Year's Eve drivers, I'm not sure I would be. So. Um, you might want to consider just stop working on the 15th, but actually retire on January 1st. Like, they can hold Christmas style. Like, <laughs> like we can you have us can hold Christmas Well, you just tell them, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not feeling <clears throat> like I'm coming to work for the next 15 days and will retire. They're not going to be able to fire you within 15 days, I don't think. So. Well, that's safe for sure. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Um, yeah, the good news is, is that you know, you don't call in sick unless you're sick, because that's that's wrong. But the good news is you don't get to the RH without something being wrong with you. So and and, and there's a lot of flu going around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <I'm saying. laughs> 
So if you're over 71, you can double dip with AA and start receiving on retirement payments. That is not a given. No. There is an IRS code, IRS code 415, that creates a loophole for some flight attendants after, who, who are older than age 70 and a half. So the very first, and it depends on when you hit age 70 and a half, because it's like the next tax period after age 70 and a half, they, the company is required to go back and audit your income. And if your income from the company is less than your monthly pension income would be, then they are required to start letting you take your pension. So most people, because all the pensions have been impacted by bankruptcy, even if they're flying the hard for you, their income it's going to be higher than their pension, you know, so it's not going to apply to a lot of people, although we still have some slightly more senior people that worked a good number of years prior and their pension may be higher than what they would be making if they're if they were only flying the hard 40, but a lot of them are still flying more than the hard 40, you know, or maybe some people who have been on medical leave for a few years and that lowers their average income might fall into that category. So it's not something you can put in for. You can go, I'm 70 and a half company. I want to start double dipping. It does not work that way. It's based on an IRS audit process. And if you're eligible to do that as an LAA flight attendant, the company is going to contact you, send you your pension paperwork and say, hey, you need to start taking your pension. And just to set expectations, I think we have four flight attendants. Uh, it, may, it may be higher than that. Maybe six, yeah, maybe six now that have gotten that. And the youngest one I've ever seen is 75, although they start the audit at 70 and a half. Um, so, and, and almost every one of those that are flying on the hard 40 instead of flying the full schedule. And they, the first couple ones that it happened to, um, they were doing that whole add your pension the, uh, for those. For those who've been around a while, the tinker factor, if you don't know what it is, don't worry about it. It's not. <laughs> so it's not a given that you're going to be able to do that no matter how long you fly, especially if you fly your schedule. But it's a possibility. Okay. Um, is single better or monthly? I think this was in the context of annuity that that question came in when you were talking about annuity. Single. That but they're they're all paid monthly. All the annuities are paid monthly. So whoever asked that question, if, if you can, you know, give us a little more information, we'll try and answer it better. I wonder if they may have been talking about straight life versus. Yeah, um, all of the annuity choices in a pension are monthly. That no matter whether you choose, you know, single, joint survivor, uh, level income, uh, minimum number, those are all paid monthly. Okay. Um, how do I access travel benefits without access to net? and do we get a travel ID? Um, again, we get our retiree ID. We don't need a travel ID other than our government issued ID. So no, we don't get a travel ID, but you can show your retiree ID, and again, maybe as a retiree, you'll be rewarded <laughs> for your years of loyalty to the company. But um, and then um, you access your um, non rev travel planner and all your travel benefits through the retirees website, which is www.retirees.aa.com. And usually about 24 to 48 hours after you retire, suddenly you're no, no longer able to get into JetNet and you so at that point, you go to the retiree's website, you use your same um, password and your same employee number, and that will let you into the retiree's website. Can you request paperwork earlier than the day to retire? And what if you request paperwork and not sure about the date? What paperwork? There uh, I think this came in when we were talking about pensions as well. OK, so pension paperwork, you can request 90 days out. Um, retirement paperwork, like just notifying the company, there is no retirement paperwork per se. So what you do is you notify your manager and they like you to notify them no more than 30 days out. And you can even only notify them two weeks out. That's their minimum requirement. So that's their minimum out. Yes. I, I hold the position there's no minimum notice, but 
Yeah. Right. The, if you needed to tell them, hey, I'm retiring tomorrow because, you know, that was bad <laughs> life and I'm not doing another one, you could do that. Legally, there's nothing they could do about it. As a courtesy, they request the two weeks, and most people give them between 30 days and two weeks' notice. And you verbally notify your flight service manager that you're going to retire. You say, for example, you know, July 31st is going to be my last day as an active employee, and August 1st is going to be my first day as a retiree. And then they want you to follow up with an email to their AA email address with the same thing. So they have something to copy or print up and put in your file that you're requesting retirement on that date. If you go to UI while on SIG prior to retirement, does one still collect a a L or a I do VC time and the second time. If you go on QI prior to retirement, you're still eligible for the vacation if you retire, no matter what. And if you're also eligible for the 65 point plan when you retire, you'll get paid for the sick time. It doesn't matter if you're on QI when you retire or not. And you can retire from QI status, medical leave, personal leave, IOD, leave of absence. So, okay. Could you let people know about filing for Medicare when still active at 65 versus waiting until after 65 and having to get gov form CMS L56? Four. That's in our next section. We're oh, about great. to do that. <laughs> great transition. Wow. Good segue. Great segue. That person is a psychic. <laughs> I think he planted that question. <laughs> All right, let's talk about medical insurance options. I think. Yeah, I think it's me. So we're going to talk about the medical insurance options um, in retirement. So the first, and notice the little dollar sign. We're going to talk a little bit about the price of those options. So COBRA is available to people who are not yet eligible for Medicare once they retire, and it is expensive. It's a lot of dollars. A lot of dollars. Oh my God, the, the AA retiree medical insurance is even more dollar signs. It's super expensive. So again, we've mentioned AA retiree medical insurance does exist and you're eligible for it. If we, you retire between 55 and 65, eligible for the 65 point plan and not yet eligible for Medicare. So, but again, not a lot of people take it because it's very, very expensive. Affordable Care Act. Okay, it still exists for the moment. I think it might survive. I, 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 <laughs> so people are you know, finding options on the healthcare website, www.healthcare.gov. So that's an option for people um, to find other alternate uh, sources of health insurance after retirement. Medicare, if you're Medicare age, and that's going to probably be one of the most affordable options. So once you're uh, eligible for Medicare, that's really your best option. Or the old fashioned way, hey, you could marry someone with insurance or go on a spouse with insurance or die young. But we don't want to do that. We got too much to do in retirement. I got plans. I got closets to organize. Yeah, he's got closets to organize. I got trips to take. I got things to do. All right, so COBRA. Um, COBRA enables you to continue the health insurance coverage that you had as an active employee. And the good thing about that is you don't have to reestablish your deductible. So if you've already met your deductible, you go on COBRA, it's just a continuation. But you're paying a lot more for it. Um, the participant pays the full cost plus a 2% admin fee. And the coverage can last for up to 18 months. Could be extended up to 29 months for people that are eligible for social security disability. Um, it must be taken within the first 60 days of whatever life event you have when you leave the company, such as retirement. And it's a one shot deal. So you take it within that period of time or you don't take it. All right, so more things about COBRA. COBRA can include medical, dental, vision, and flex spending accounts. You can mix and match. So a lot of people who are eligible for Medicare when they retire, so they don't elect COBRA Medical, um, they do continue their dental and vision coverage as long as possible through COBRA. 
Once insurance begins, it's retro to the date. So, you know, I told you about that little administrative lag time. Your trigger for being offered COBRA is your retirement. So once you retire, then you're eligible. Uh, most people go online to the Benefits Service Center and elect their COBRA once they can get into the retiree's website. Um, and then once you sign up for it, it's retro back to the first day of your retirement. Um, payments, you don't want to be late with COBRA. Most people do set up a direct debit of some kind to cover the payments because if you miss a payment, they can drop you. And will drop you. And, and, and will drop you, yes. Oh, and one last thing. If you're eligible for Medicare, COBRA is not considered creditable coverage um, as an alternative to Medicare. So you can't say, hey, I'm eligible for Medicare, but I'd like my company health coverage. It doesn't work that way. Once you're eligible for Medicare and you're offered COBRA, COBRA is always considered secondary to Medicare. So even if you say, hey, I'm going to keep my company insurance, you don't sign up for Medicare, guess what? They're going to pay as though you have Medicare anyway. So you need to go ahead and sign up for Medicare. Um, okay, retiree medical insurance. Um, we mentioned a couple of times before, you got to be between the ages of 55 and 65 at the time of your retirement and eligible for the 65 point plan. It's an expensive uh, coverage and the participant pays the full cost. The price is uncapped. It actually doubled in 2015. So if you're on a you know, fixed income and you're trying to manage your budget, it can be pretty unstable and hard to do that. Okay, so how much does it cost? Here are the retiree insurance rates um, for 2023. But just wanted to show you it is a good plan. Um, it's $150 deductible mm -hmm. per person, um, $1,000 out of pocket max for an individual. So that's pretty good. It is an old plan that was grandfathered under the, you know, Affordable Care Act. Um, retiree plans didn't have to cover a lot of the preventive stuff that they do now. So if you're thinking of signing up for it now, you're one of the VOP people that your active rate coverage is ending um, and you have money in your RHRA to cover it, just remember it's structured a little bit differently. Back in the day, we used to go to the doctor and we had always went to the doctor with a reason, a diagnostic reason to go to the doctor because this plan covers medically necessary. It doesn't cover most of the preventive stuff that's now covered for free with the new plans post Affordable Care Act. So keep that in mind. Um, okay, so the ouch factor per person per month, $2,171. I never thought, I, it was always high, but I never thought I'd see it. That is absurd. That's crazy. So, but there are a few people, the VIP people with the RHRA money that are taking it because that's what the RHRA is for, it's for your health benefits. All right, so now that you've seen the cost and our emotional support goat has faded, what are some better options? So we discussed the Affordable Care Act. You go to www.healthcare.gov. You could be entitled to tax credits if your income is low enough. Um, VIA Benefits is the company that AA contracts with to assist people who retire both before and after their Medicare eligibility date. So if you are before the age of 65 or not eligible for Medicare, then you can go to VIA Benefits and they'll help you find an Affordable Care Act plan. If you're post 65, they will help you find a Medicare plan. So uh, their contact information is in our retirement packet. Um, so you don't have to take a picture of the slide or anything if you don't want to, but you could go to myviabenefits.com slash American Airlines. All right, so now we're to Medicare, and hopefully the person that asked that question is still hanging around. We're going to answer that now. Um, if your employees or spouses are over the age of 65 and they're still working, they can remain on AA insurance. So the whole requirement to start Medicare only uh, comes into play after you retire or, or if you're offered COBRA for any reason and you're eligible for Medicare. So 
Um, if you're working, everyone in the world is going to tell you you have to sign up for Medicare, you have to sign up for Medicare. Guess what? You don't. Most people go ahead and sign up for Medicare Part A. That is the hospitalization portion of Medicare that's free for most people. So if you've been working and contributing your little FICA tax all along, then Part A is going to be free for you. So a lot of people go ahead and sign up for Part A. There's not really a downside to it unless there's one situation where you don't want to sign up for Part A if you're still working, and that's if you're in the or plan, that's the high deductible plan with AA that has the health reimbursement account or the health okay. aid, health HSA. HSA, not HRA. There's another plan called the plus plan that has a HRA, which is a health reimbursement account. You can be in that. You can be in any of the other plans. But if you're in the um, core plan with the health savings account, which lets you take money for you know, to apply to Medicare expenses after retirement, you're not allowed to have Medicare at the same time that you're contributing to that account. So the core plan is the only plan that if you're in that, you don't want to sign up for any part of Medicare until after you retire. Um, part B, in case you wanted to know, that's the doctor's visits to the labs and Medicare Part D, E for drug, that's your prescription drug coverage. Um, if you are eligible for Medicare and you have retired, um, you need to sign up um, as soon as possible, I think within 60 days or 90 days, something will take 60 days to be safe. And if you have been working past the age of 65, there is a form you need to get from your employer, American Airlines, stating that you've had coverage through them since you turned 65. That way Medicare knows you've had what they call creditable coverage and you're not uh, they're, they're not going to stick you with any late enrollment fees. And the form is called the Medicare CMSL 564, or we call it the Employment Verification Form. And here's the form. This is what it looks like. You just fill out the top portion with your information. You fax it into the company, or the form can be uploaded on JetNet. You can fill it out and upload it on JetNet. And then once they get it, they're going to fill out their portion, send it back, and you'll be good to go when you're signing up for Medicare. Now, a lot of people want to request this form like six months out, again, being type A, like, and it's like to be organized. It's not good to do that because what Medicare is going to do when they get this form along with your application for Medicare Part B, they're going to do a 60-day look back and make sure you've had coverage within the last 60 days. So really the best time to request to download this form and send it into the company is 60 days prior to your retirement date or 60 days prior to when you're going to commence your Medicare. So, just so you know, I've had a couple of people that have asked for one and then had to send in a new one because they retired. You know, Medicare didn't see what they needed to see when they requested it more than 60 days out. Can I, can I talk about that for that phone for a second? We can talk about that phone. And we had a question about, well, what if I, instead of, you know, working at 68 and then having to fill out this form, what if I just went to Medicare at 65 while I'm still working? Absolutely an option. Uh, you have to sign uh, multiple forms with America that says, yes, I'm giving up my insurance. Yes, I know I'm going to get it back. And here's my first born. No, you actually can get it back. You can get it back. Okay. Benefits enrollment. Oh, well, that's right. That's right. If you want to cop uh, out of the Medicare and come back on it, I'd one person do that. But, yeah. um, but you can. A lot of people are actually choosing Medicare now because the company benefits have gotten a lot more expensive. So it's been more than ever before this year who are actually choosing to go ahead and go on Medicare instead of keeping the company insurance, which is... And, and it's good that you can go back and forth because uh, some people go to Medicare and discover that it's it, it's expensive in some ways and inexpensive in others. So, you'll, you, you know, your mileage may vary depending on which uh, which plan you end, in, uh, end up in. So, uh, that ability to swap back and forth. But uh, yeah, that would be one way to avoid having to deal with this form is just go to Medicare at 65. Mm -hmm. And another thing I've seen, if you're generally a pretty healthy person, Medicare can be less expensive, you know, than the company insurance. But 
the people that are really seeing a price difference with Medicaid are if you have expensive prescription drugs. So um, you really want to check with an, a Medicare advisor and then do some comparison. So if you're thinking about going on Medicare while you're still working, you know, you have a choice at that point. Once you retire, you don't really have a choice anymore if you're Medicare eligible. But um, a lot of people see their prescription drugs are a bit higher with Medicare, um, certain types of drugs than when they were covered by the AA prescription drug insurance. All right. Let's talk about Medicare for a little bit. Okay. Do you want to talk about it? No, I think, I think you blew past my bookmark. You need to talk. I need like to talk. <laughs> um, there are, the, the problem with Medicare is that it's an 80 20 plan. So you go into the hospital and uh, you have a million dollar bill, they pay it 800,000, it's an 80 20 plan. The difficulty is, is that you have that 20% to pay. And if it's a million dollar bill, you have 20% and it's 200,000. Uh, I can't pay that. So uh, you have to get an insurance plan called the Medigap plan. Also sometimes called the supplemental plan. And uh, supplemental slash Medigap covers that 20% uh, that you have to pay. And the other problem with Medicare is that there's no out-of-pocket match. That you have a $10 million bill, you still have to pay the 20%. There's no out-of-pocket match. So you're going to want that Medigap policy. So you've got your A, your B, your D, and your, your Medigap or supplemental plan. The thing about the supplemental plan is that there are a lot of twists and different options. So Medicare has standardized the plan. There are 10 different Medicare, Medigap plans available. And uh, we have a, a copy of that chart in the good slide packet. And so you'll want to look for things on that, like uh, am, I, am I going to travel internationally? Which of those supplemental plans will cover international travel? Uh, I have uh, some specialists. Which of those plans will cover those specialists? So you're going to want to chop that. Uh, we are also, because we are A retirees, we have an 11 option that non airline people don't have. Um, and it's a fee book created specifically for retiree airline workers. I don't think it's anything magical. Uh, however, it has some, some tweaks in it that the other 10 do not have. So add that into the list and just find a plan that's going to work best for you. Um, now, so oh, that's, that's way too many parts. I need it simpler. Well, they have a simple option. And that's part C, also called an advantage plan. You'll notice that it's spelled with one A, advantage. <laughs> um, and uh, the advantage yeah, yeah, I think yeah. They, they roll all of the Medicare into one plan and sell it to you. And it's actually uh, can be really quite simple and quite easy. Um, and it's also very profitable for the insurance company. So they want you to sign up for it. And so they offer you some bonuses for signing up. So for instance, they may say, hey, if you take our Golden Secret plan, we will give you a free gym membership, or we will give you dental coverage, or we'll give you vision coverage. I like that dental coverage part, because that's hard for retirees. Um, so there may be some advantages uh, uh, to you taking an advantage plan. Uh, the, the difficulty is, is that the Advantage plans available, say, in Phoenix, are going to be a lot different than the Advantage plans available in Durango, Colorado. So, um, and the Advantage plans are also uh, HMOs, so you have to go to a doctor in their network. Yeah, are their structures more similar to HMOs? Right, right. The structure is more similar. Yeah, they're not really HMOs, but they're, they're like that. They have a, a list of approved providers. Um, and there's many different ways to structure the Advantage plans. Uh, there's actually one in Florida where your copay is zero. Um, you have a, 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 I mean, your premium is zero. You, you know? pay for Medicare Part B, I right. think. You pay, you for, pay part for, for D and all. It, part D, get all, uh, and the supplemental is rolled in there. So um, now you're out of your uh, co-pays uh, tend to be a little higher in that plan. But if you don't use your insurance because you know, you're a healthy 68 year old, darn you. Um, the, um, yeah, it, so there are a lot of options out there on Advantage plans. And it's all the Medicare advisor because they have, they have insights in all of these different plans available. Or you can go to Medicare.gov, which you know, for a government website has really good um, guidance on how to, how to shop those products.
So that's insurance. That's income. That's getting ready. What else do I need to research, Ken? Yeah? Okay, there's annoying little details I talked about earlier. What else do I need to research? Talk about life events, um, optional insurance coverage, dental insurance, um, your flex spending account, how to manage that. Okay, so life events. Um, one thing to remember is that your retirement is your spouse or your partner's life events. So if you wanted to go on a spouse's or a partner's insurance, um, the trigger to that life event is your retirement. So you usually you have between 30 and 60 days once you retire to go on your spouse or your partner's um, health coverage. Uh, they have all the guys were saying 30 days to be safe because it's always better to do it sooner and not procrastinate. So did I. <laughs> <laughs> but 30 days to fill in, file for the life event, make the change to add you to their health insurance. Um, if you're married to another AA employee, remember that you can go on their health insurance, and a lot of people do. But when you do that, you're essentially changing plans. So any deductibles out of pocket maxes are going to reset and you're going to have to reestablish those under their insurance. All right, optional life insurance. This is the examples are um, at life legal, long term care, home auto policies, pet insurance. Any of those can be continued. Um, you just have to contact the administrator of those various plans and set up for them to bill you directly or debit you directly. Your employee life insurance, we did mention this earlier, um, it ends when you retire. However, you have 30 days to port or convert that into an individual policy. So um, it's term life insurance, so like your car or your house insurance, it only the coverage only exists while you're paying the premiums, and this life insurance does not have a cash value. But if you uh, didn't get some other kind of life insurance, then some people want to at least port or convert a portion of this, you know, if they need it. Um, sometimes people who have health issues choose to do that, even though it's expensive. Um, it's like I said, it may be ported or converted into a private policy, and you have about 30 days to do that from the date of your retirement. Um, it doesn't require a physical exam to qualify, no health questions, so that's a good thing. You can continue it without any health questions. Um, MetLife uh, is the administrator of the life insurance with the company, or a lineup, but I think it may have changed to something else recently. So maybe like Sigma or something like that, I'll double check. Um, but I think the health department people said that changed for the AD&D or voluntary, voluntary personal accident insurance. But if you wanted to continue those, you could just contact the uh, Benefits Service Center and they would tell you what you need to do in order to continue those. Also, your long-term and short-term disability coverage will end when you retire. So if you had that for years, never used it, you don't have the coverage anymore once you retire because it's disability insurance based on being disabled from your flight attendant job. However, if you have an ongoing claim with MetLife for long or short-term disability and you retire because of that health issue and that health issue continues, you may be able to still get long or short term disability benefits after you retire. All right, dental insurance. Ah, it's really scary, but nobody seems to want to take care of retirees' teeth. And we're living longer, they really need to fix that. But um, there is MetLife retiree dental insurance. It's zip code rated, it's kind of a high dollar, low benefit thing. So most people don't take it. So, what are some other options? Um, the AA Credit Union has a dental club with the Benefit Services of America. Um, but it's more like a discount network. If you sign up for it and you go to the doctors that are in that network, you get a discounted rate on your dental services. Um, Costco has something similar. Also, dental schools, you can go, you can be a guinea pig, and hey, once the bleeding stops, you'll, your teeth will look great. So some people do do that and say they get a pretty good treatment at the dental schools, and it's a lot less expensive. 
My neighbor was telling me that they signed up for a dental club and they said it had the unfortunate name of Delta. Delta Dental, yeah, I've heard I've used it quite a bit. So um, that's something that people do in conjunction with their Medicare coverage. So, and then um, Medicare supplement plans and the advantage plans now more often, and they're adding a lot more dental components to that. So if you talk to your Medicare uh, advisor, say, is there a supplement plan or an advantage plan that has dental rider or a dental component that I can sign up? All right, flex spending. So with your flex spending account, normally if you get to the end of the year with your flex spending account and you haven't spent all of it, maybe I think I'll carry $500 over into the next year, you lose it, you know, so it's use it or lose it with the flex spending accounts. Um, so with retirement, you want to use it all before you retire. So, and you can work that to your advantage. For instance, uh, you can use it all in the first couple of months of the year. So say you put in a thousand dollars and you're making a deposit, or say you put in twelve hundred dollars and you're making a hundred dollar deposit every month, and you use the whole twelve hundred by the end of February, for example, and then you retire on March first. Guess what? You've only paid two hundred dollars. You got a twelve hundred dollar benefit that's paid back to you, and then the company can't come after you for the rest of those deposits for the rest of the year. So in this circumstance, and this is the only time it works this way, you use it and they lose it. So yeah, kind of, some people will use that to their advantage when they retire. And it's a smart thing to do. All right, so Patrick, a little words about retirement. Yeah. Make sure you're ready. <laughs> exactly, make sure you're ready. But it, it's your turn to decide. You've got a lot of information here, and uh, there are a lot of moving pieces, but nothing you can't handle. I mean, think about your normal work day. You handle hundreds of people, connections, food, but, but, but you're used to that. Um, what else do you need to do before you leave? Well, start a checklist. Um, the uh, checklist in the back of our handout is a good place to start. Um, that's why it depends. Uh, there's the question is how do you how do you work your checklist, folks? CQ all over again in order, just like the plan emergency checklist. So start 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 the APFA checklist there. Add things that are unique to you. Uh, it may be your spouse's insurance. It may be something. But work your checklist because if you've got a checklist, you're going to be a whole lot less overwhelmed because you know what's done. You know what's coming. Get yourself a plan, a plan of departure checklist, um, and you'll find it will work wonders. And don't be afraid to ask questions. You've never retired before, most likely. Um, so yeah, ask questions. And there are an awful lot of resources. Uh, APFA has the entire retirement department. Uh, we've got all of these resources here. American has a retirement department. Uh, there are all kinds of advisors out there, some that work uh, are paid to just do advice, some that charge you a fee, but there's a lot of people out there, a lot of resources. And don't be shy because you really want to make sure that you get this right the first time. And I know you're prepared. You got this. You're ready. Let's go. Good slide. Good slide. <laughs> All right. Questions? Okay. Um, I currently. Have my daughter as my registered companion. What happens when I retire? Does she lose those passes on the final day of employment? Also, can I change my registered companion during the last 30 days of employment? So you're still entitled to have a registered companion as a retiree. So if that's your daughter, then that's going to carry over unless you change it. And yes, you can change it. I did. Think how long you have to have it? Is it 12 months? I think it's 12 months. So you pay 12 change from your daughter to the pool boy. Yeah. yeah. But you got to keep that. She's a D3 now. <laughs> <laughs> if she even, yeah, I mean, so yes, you can still have a registered companion or a spouse, one or the other, um, after you retire. Okay. Um, would vacation pay be for 2023 to 2024? 
Okay. You, 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 like I was talking about before, you've accrued all of the vacation in 2022. I think for me that was 35 days, so that was after the entire month, the yes. entire year. That's what we're bidding for now. That's what we're bidding for now is that 35 days. If I retire tomorrow, they're still going to pay that to me. Mm -hmm. So I have my bid and haven't used it yet. So my awarded but not used in April, and now I've got my 35 days from the 22 accrual. So I will get paid for all of it um, that I haven't been paid for yet. They don't get to keep any of it. So if you retire in, you know, July, July 1st, you're going to get any vacation that you have bid for that you have not yet used. And then you're also going to get whatever you've re accrued between January and the end of June. So you'll get anything you've accrued that we haven't even bid for in in addition to anything we bid for that you haven't used. Being single, can I still change my D2 travel companion every year? I think we just talked about that. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. After 12 months, you're able to change your D2 travel companion to the whole way. <laughs> um, what is the Medicare employment form name again? It's the Medicare CMSL564. And it's like notice of employment verification or something like that. And we have a copy of it in our retirement packet. And it's also available on JetNet and on the Medicare and Social Security websites. I think of Medicare.gov for sure. What if you decide to go on spouse insurance on retirement? Do you need to no notify Medicare? If you're Medicare eligible, you and you go on your spouse's insurance when you retire, um, depending on when, you know, how old you are and everything, you might need to get one of those forms when your husband or wife retires and um, that, then you go on a Medicaid or so you'll definitely need to get one from their company. But if you worked several years after the age of 65 at AA, you may need to also get one from AA, but you won't need to do that until that spouse retires and, you, and you're ready to go on Medicare. And I also can't tell what they, they're asking about, do I need to tell Medicare that I'm not coming? No, Medicare doesn't reach out and grab you until you call them and say, hey, I want insurance. As a retiree, do my parents still get travel benefits? Yes, you still get D2P when you're a retiree, D2PR or D2RP. <laughs> for the parents. For the parents. Okay, and, and you should know, even though the letter P comes ahead of R in the alphabet, a D2R gets on the aircraft before a D2P. Okay. Um, where is the VBO list? V E B A. Uh, you'll find contact information for the VIVA in our uh, handy dandy uh, list of uh, contact. contact. And in particular, the Voluntary Accident Insurance Benefit Association is on page 40. In our retirement packet, and there's also there's some limited information about who to call to get more information on the APFA website on the retirement page. Speaking of the packet, is there a chart in the packet that lists all the dates that forms need to be submitted by? Well, that's our checklist that kind of gives you a general idea of what to do 30 days out, 60 days out, 90 days out. So it's not really a chart, but it is a checklist. Okay. Uh, I plan to retire in 12 months, currently 66 years and four months old. If I move to Medicare now while, an act, uh, while active, can I keep my wife on AA medical for the remaining 12 months? I think with active insurance, in order to have a family member on it, you have to be on it. Yes. But I would double check with uh, the Benefit Service Center or the Health Department here at APFA to get that answer. Okay. All right, last question. Will this seminar be available for streaming? If not, when will this happen again? We don't have the date set for the next retirement seminar, but if you do visit the APFA.org website and navigate to the retirement page, we have the previous seminars that we've held. Uh, they are on there for you to watch at your leisure. And then um, once this is finished, this, uh, this 
webinar will also go out via online uh, for you to watch again if you missed the first portion of it. And this will probably be sometime next week. Sometime next week, we'll have next week when it will be up on the on the website available for streaming. That's right. you get all of my Photoshop in <laughs> I, I wish they were doing that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any part of us? Um, no, I think we covered everything. everything. Also, I just wanted to let you know that this it's the beginning of the calendar year. Last year we did one sort of a, you know, subject specific retirement if seminar about Medicare. We're probably going to try and do one or two special seminars this year. We're still ironing out the details of that. And we're going to try and have one, at least one retirement seminar or other financial planning or Medicare or something seminar at least, you know, one in a month for most of the months of the year. We will maybe if it's a month with a lot of holidays or month where both Patrick and I have a vacation in the same month, we may skip a month, but most months we're going to try and have at least one seminar of some sort. So. Just uh, I, I answer a lot of questions and then I go and talk to people after they've retired and I have become very confident that our work group, uh, even though it seems overwhelming, our work group can handle it. You got it. Let's go. Most people, they're stressed, but they're much more organized than they realize. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we again encourage you to download, download the Good Slide Packet from the ADPFA website and reach out to us if you have any questions. Be well. Thank you. Bye.